hello, uh, hello, folks. And uh, it's great to be here at the India Science Fest, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for putting this together. So um, I, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about um, the uh, quest of fundamental physics, but in some ways a, a snapshot of that, a slice of that, uh, through the life of Stephen Hawking, the work of Stephen Hawking, uh, because most people have heard of Hawking, but um, uh, perhaps many people don't appreciate the importance of his work or the significance in modern physics of his discoveries. So that's something that I'll try to convey to you in the next half an hour, and I'll be happy to take questions. So. Um, Stephen Hawking, as uh, people know, was perhaps the best known living scientist in the last few decades. And uh, what uh, made, his, um, made him a uh, celebrity was, of course, the inspiring story of this brilliant mind, which is captured in a failing body and yet managing to transcend it. And you see Hawking uh, uh, over the years. These are snapshots of Hawking as the degenerative neural uh, 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 medical issue that he had uh, gradually confined him more and more, and uh, and he was effectively incapacitated. But nevertheless, continuing to think about some of the most profound questions uh, of uh, physics, and uh, that's what I will try to talk about, rather than about his life, which perhaps you might have seen the movie and. Uh, 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 or read his books and so on. Uh, but um, uh, I'll try to put his work in a broader context, and I'll focus more on the contributions he made in the 1970s, which, uh, in a sense, are the ones which have uh, been uh, um, most uh, significant and which continue to drive uh, the uh, drive progress in physics. And this has to do with properties of black holes and in some ways of the Big Bang itself, uh, the Big Bang singularity, the origin of the universe. Uh, so, so you can view in a way his work as part of the journey of physics which uh, takes us from the very, very small, the really microcosmos uh, to the very, very large, uh, the macrocosmos uh, or, or the other way around and in a way I'll go th in the opposite direction from the very, very large to the very, very small. So, uh, but before that, I just want to make a few comments about the nature of physical laws. So, physical laws are a, a way to capture the regularities and patterns of nature that we see around us. And, um, uh, of course, a lot of nature appears chaotic and you struggle to discern patterns. But then uh, people notice very simple, uh, uh, simple phenomena which are amenable to description, uh, a mathematical description. And for instance, if I just drop this uh, pointer right now, you know how it falls, and that's due to the laws of motion of Newton. Uh, then um, uh, you, you, uh, you study how two magnets uh, uh, attract or repel each other, and then you discover, and people discover the laws of electromagnetism and those between currents and so on. So, um, uh, so the remarkable thing about the laws of physics is that uh, as you expand your domain of knowledge, you, can, you seem to be able to continue to describe them in very precise mathematical terms. And uh, the mathematics becomes more and more sophisticated. But nevertheless, it's rather remarkable if you think about it that we can explain phenomena across a whole range of length scales and time scales from the very, very small to the very, very large using a precise mathematical uh, equations. And, um, and uh, so, so we, when, even when we go to regimes which are far from our normal experience, this continues to hold. Uh, so I, I will focus mostly on the force of gravity, which is in some ways the most tangible force, the, most, the force that you literally feel in your bones. Uh, and, uh, and gravity was also the force which uh, in a way admitted the first universal description. And this is uh, the genius of Isaac Newton that he, uh, he proposed this inverse square law that people 
uh, you must have seen in your uh, school textbooks, the, uh, the ones that uh, describe um, not just the motion, not just what happens when I throw this pointer here on the stage, but what uh, the moon, uh, what governs the moon as it goes around the earth or the earth as it goes around the sun or indeed on, uh, sca uh, on uh, uh, scales which are even beyond the solar system, though Newton was not aware of that. <laughs> but he nevertheless had the... Uh, uh, he had the vision to propose that this law of gravitation applies universally uh, and indeed it is a very good approximation, a very good description of the motion of planets in our solar system and uh, when ISRO sends its uh, satellites, uh, Chandrayaan and uh, other missions to the moon or Mars and so on, uh, the trajectories are computed using Newton's laws. But uh, when we, what we learn is Remember, as I said, if you do expand your domain of experience, you come across, uh, you realize that you have to sort of extend your physical laws, and that's what has happened with our understanding of gravity as well. And so when we go to the very large in the cosmos, much beyond the uh, uh, regularities of our solar system, we find that uh, actually Newton's laws break down, they're only approximately true, and this is where the Einstein's picture of gravity, which, um, try, which addressed some of the failings of Newton's laws, comes in. And the key insight of Einstein was that gravity uh, is essentially a manifestation of geometry of space and time. Uh, and, uh, uh, and again, the genius of Einstein was that uh, in, uh, in realizing that you need to generalize Newton's law, you, you don't just change it by a little, in a little way. So you might, your first in instinct if you said that, oh, Newton's law is only approximately true, is you might have tried to tinker with that equation, the inverse square law equation, and add a few terms to sort of correct for things. And indeed, you can do that if you want to correct for some of the anomalies in the um, orbit of Mercury. But, um, uh, but Einstein realized, in fact, that uh, an, um, a more accurate description of the force of gravity uh, it requires you to overhaul the very framework in which you describe gravity. So he tied up the description of gravity with, the, with a precise mathematical description in, of the geometry of space and time. And so in, his, uh, in, in the picture that uh, he proposed, which is what we still use for the macrocosmos, space-time is no longer a passive stage uh, for all the drama of physical events that we all participate in and everything else that goes on happens, it actually becomes an active participant itself. So it's as if you're in a, uh, you're watching a movie in which the stage itself is one of the characters and responds to the way the others in it are, uh, are moving and, rea and uh, behaving. And, and, and in turn, uh, the, uh, the people, uh, the participants act on the space-time. So there's a kind of a, uh, active uh, participation of space-time with the matter that is inside it. Uh, so, so you might ask, why do we need this generalized framework uh, of Einstein? Uh, as I said, when you go beyond the solar system, you realize that our, the behavior of things in our solar system is relatively tame. Uh, we have extreme environments in astrophysics. For instance, there are ex highly dense or fast-moving objects like neutron stars and pulsars, and uh, as we'll soon get to, black holes of various varieties from uh, stellar scale to galactic scale. So uh, these extreme events uh, one realizes can uh, Newton's law is inadequate to describe them, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and you need Einstein's theory, and indeed it has been very successful, uh, as we'll see. 
but I just want to point out that this abstract uh, theory of Einstein in terms of the geometry of space and time, the, uh, which is, again, captured in precise mathematical terms in terms of the framework of Riemannian geometry, this has down-to-earth consequences. Uh, for instance, the gravitation, no, the picture of gravitation in terms of space and time tells you that in a gravitational field, clocks move at different speed, uh, clocks move at different rates depending on where you are in the gravitational field, and therefore a satellite up there, uh, the time measured by the satellite at the satellite is a little different. There's a small correction uh, from what is measured here on Earth, and this is very this correction is very important to take into account to have the accuracy of GPS systems like the one that you have on your smartphone. So, uh, so in a sense, Einstein's theory is uh, through from all this mathematical framework you extract very significant consequences which affect uh, things that are in your pockets. So, um, but coming back to, um, uh, to the broader theme uh, of the talk, black holes are in some ways uh, very, uh, are a very, uh, are a immediate consequence of Einstein's equation and in a way the most enigmatic prediction because it's, uh, it, these are objects that uh, were not uh, uh, are things that you you might at first sight find very difficult to conceive of. Uh, they uh, it turns out now that we have seen black holes, and the picture on the right hand side uh, here is a sort of a reconstructed image of a, a galactic black hole of several billion times the mass of the sun at the center of the M87 galaxy. The middle picture is actually also a kind of a simulation. Uh, of the um, binary black hole system which collided and generated gravitational waves that uh, one uh, uh, detected in the LIGO uh, observatory. Uh, but before these two uh, detections of black holes, uh, recently in just the last five years, people had to resort to the kind of pictures uh, one had on the left-hand side, uh, which uh, uh, which was an artist's depiction, but now you don't need that. So this, uh, 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 typically a stellar black hole is formed when a dying star, a star is unable to withstand its uh, gravitational collapse, and this is one of the consequences of Chandrasekhar's study of, um, uh, of uh, uh, very dense stars. The gravitational field itself becomes so strong that and the space-time hence becomes so curved that uh, the light itself cannot escape from behind a certain region called the horizon, which is a sphere whose proportional to the radius of the uh, whose radius is proportional to the mass of the star uh, that's collapsing. Uh, and uh, initially, it was detected, um, as I said, indirectly from various companion stars, but now through the LIGO detection in 2015 and the uh, event horizon telescope image, you know more about them. Uh, so why are these black holes so important? They are firstly very uh, unique solutions of Einstein's equations. They are highly symmetric. Uh, they are uniquely specified by their mass and their angular momentum or spin. They have a very uh, remarkable property. I mean, this horizon is, of course, a very remarkable feature that there is a region behind, from behind which nothing essentially escapes. Um, light itself uh, uh, cannot escape. Uh, but there is, uh, behind the horizon, there is also a rather rem uh, very uh, as yet ill-understood feature, which is something called the singularity, where the curvature, in fact, blows up, it becomes infinite, uh, and Einstein's equations, in fact, stop making sense there. One of the first results of Hawking, together with Penrose, which really brought him fame, was in his PhD thesis, where he showed that this behavior whereby you have singularities uh, is rather generic. It's not special to highly symmetric solutions. It, require, it, it happens in any collapse <laughs> Of, um, uh, uh, of matter, it also generically happens at the Big Bang singularity. Uh, so there was a controversy whether these singularities are some kind of uh, 
just some very special artifacts, but Hawking and Penrose showed that no Einstein's equations generically uh, require that uh, when you have matter, the attractive force of matter uh, of gravity leads to singularities. And uh, I want to mention the work of Amal Rai Chaudhary, who was a rather unsung hero of Indian science, uh, who uh, worked at Presidency uh, College at Kolkata, and whose equation for the focusing of um, matter in the presence of gravity uh, was very crucial in Hawking and Penrose's work that established this result. So, uh, but then uh, Hawking's focus shifted from the singularity to this other uh, remarkable uh, feature of black holes, namely the horizon. And um, uh, he discovered a rather striking fact about it that the area, no matter what you do, no matter what happens, a black hole cannot split up into something with, say, smaller area. It, uh, whatever happens, the area of that horizon, remember it was roughly a sphere uh, of radius proportional to the mass, that always increases. And um, uh, so this was, some, again, a consequence of Einstein's equations. Uh, and uh, he developed, together with um, uh, Bardeen and Carter, um, uh, um, generalization of these uh, laws. In fact, he call, they called them the four laws of black hole mechanics, because it was somewhat like the four laws of thermodynamics that maybe you have seen in school or college textbooks. Uh, and the area increase that I just mentioned was like the second law of thermodynamics in which entropy uh, or disorder uh, is always increasing. So, um, uh, so this seemed very curious because uh, uh, on one side you're talking about black holes which uh, are uh, very macroscopic objects in the universe which have all these features I told you. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you're talking of thermodynamics which is something you think of associated with objects with a temperature which have a lot of internal structure in them like all the gas molecules in this uh, tent over here which are heated by this uh, radiation coming from the sun. So uh, it did, uh, at first sight, the fact that uh, uh, that black holes seem to have uh, some, uh, the, for instance, the acceleration due to gravity at the horizon of the black hole seemed to be playing the same role as temperature does in thermodynamic laws. But, um, uh, but then it was very, uh, it seemed very absurd that this should be associated with a temperature. Uh, and once, and finally, uh, uh, any object which has a temperature and entropy is thermodynamic, it, it would radiate if it was in contact with uh, the vacuum, uh, with empty space. But black holes, uh, I just said, have nothing escaping them. So how can they, uh, how can black holes uh, have any kind of temperature? So this is, in fact, Hawking found this very absurd and uh, tried to disprove this idea, showed that this cannot be the case. Uh, and uh, to, to, uh, to, before I tell you that, let me uh, uh, step back a little to the, now to the other end of the scale, to the microcosmos. Uh, and um, so all of you probably know that the existence of atoms is due to the quantum or the wave nature of the constituent particles, namely electrons and protons. And similarly, light itself has a dual particle nature and not just a wave-like nature. And this cartoon sort of captures that where if you squint your eyes, you'll see particle. But if you uh, squint the other way, you'll see wave. Do you see that? Uh, so you see particle or wave, but it's very difficult to see both at the same time, right? So that's what the exclamation mark uh, with the dot tells you. So it's either the wave or a particle. And this quantum nature, of course, by the way, is the basis of all our modern gadgetry. Uh, and uh, in some ways, the, uh, the modern technological societies, the, uh, the, uh, the economic foundations rest on, uh, on the laws of quantum mechanics, something I try to emphasize to show the importance of basic understanding to, uh, uh, to the kind of society we live in. So anyhow, coming back to the main story, 
All that I said so far was about the Einstein's theory and all the results of Hawking was sort of classical because the quantum effects were not really taken into consideration um, uh, um, in uh, describing Einstein's theory is a purely classical theory like Maxwell's theory is. Uh, it tells you it's a very deterministic theory to, and you believe it is holds at very large scales. So Hawking asked the question, if we consider a black hole in a quantum universe, in a world in which there are quantum effects, what do you, uh, what do you find? And um, he found, in a way to his surprise, that black holes actually do have a temperature and radiate. And in fact, uh, this is uh, simplest, uh, the, what I've written down, there are only two formulas in this talk, um, and the temperature, uh, the formula on the left-hand side is the temperature um, that Hawking found uh, for the simplest kind of black hole. It is proportional to the Planck's constant, uh, this H, and um, inversely proportional to the Newton's constant, G, of gravitation, and also in this case, the mass uh, of the black hole. There are the speed of light uh, is also enters into this and the Boltzmann's constant, but I, I, I suppress those. But uh, it's remarkable that the Planck's constant, the Newton's constant enter into this. Um, these are some of the fundamental constants of nature. And uh, associated to this temperature, uh, there's an entropy which is proportional to the area. A is the area of that horizon, which is roughly like the mass squared because I told you the radius is proportional to the mass, so the area is proportional to the radius square or mass square, and uh, once again has the h bar and Newton's constant in it. So these were Hawking's fundamental discovery that in a, if you take into account quantum effects, black holes do radiate, and, uh, and, it's, um, and in, in some sense can evaporate even, uh, just like any a hot body uh, after losing energy uh, uh, evaporates. But the entropy, I, I want to stress a little bit on the second formula, which is on the entropy. Now, entropy is a sophisticated concept that perhaps some of you may have studied, but the underlying, uh, uh, the basic, uh, uh, the basic, uh, um, what is entropy? Essentially, it is a measure of the complexity of the internal structure of an entity, of a composite object like the molecules of gas in a jar or in this tent, and so on. And in fact, there's a mathematical way of stating it as the logarithm of the total number of states that uh, a configuration can be in. And uh, Hawking's result was sort of, in multiple ways, astonishing because um, a black hole has, uh, in Einstein's theory, is, I said, a very unique s a solution. So there is no possibility in Einstein's theory of accommodating any internal configurations to des uh, describe a black hole. And only a quantum theory of gravity can give rise to all the different states of black holes. And so this is a major challenge if you are trying to go beyond Einstein to derive a theory of gravity, which is not just uh, which is not just true at the large macroscopic levels where classical uh, where a classical description holds, but if you want to describe things at the very small scales, uh, then uh, you need a quantum theory of gravity, and it's a challenge for any quantum theory of gravity. So tomorrow, if you want to uh, propose a, a new quantum theory of gravity, your challenge is to use that to account for all these so-called microstates or these internal configurations of uh, a black hole and derive this uh, Bekenstein-Hawking formula that in the previous slide, uh, the one that was proportional to area over four uh, Newton's constant, and they derive that from counting the number of possible microstates. Uh, the, just the way in which people use the uh, knowledge of atom, uh, the atomic structure to account for the thermodynamic entropy of gases in a, 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 in a box and so on. Uh, so the basis of 
classical thermodynamics was understood by after understanding uh, that atoms constituted uh, all matter and uh, their different configurations accounts for their entropy and hence governs the temperature and all the thermodynamic laws. So we need a similar quantum theory of gravity and Einstein and Hawking's result really forced that issue in a very sharp and very uh, precise form. Uh, so this is the challenge that um, uh, that uh, um, uh, that is uh, for, there for theoretical physics, and string theory uh, has, in a sense, uh, taken on that challenge. And uh, string theory is a framework for quantum gravity in which the basic objects are one-dimensional string-like entities, either sort of closed rubber band-like objects or uh, um, or uh, open, open-ended string-like, uh, uh, open-ended uh, threads, and uh, the uh, remarkable feature of these extended objects is that they contain very naturally the basic excitations of the gravitational field, just like the photon is uh, the photon. The photon is the excitation of the electromagnetic field. The graviton is a similar uh, excitation of the gravitational field. And, uh, and uh, moreover, this challenge that I mentioned about capturing the entropy of black holes, at least for a large class of these black holes, uh, uh, string theory manages to reproduce Hawking's answer. And moreover, derive corrections to it. This, this was Hawking's answer was in some sense the leading approximation to the entropy of a black hole for a very large black hole. But then you can talk about uh, uh, corrections uh, if the area is not very large in the natural unit. Uh, so, um, so in that sense, string theory has uh, been uh, fairly successful. In, um, in giving a consistent description which accounts for Hawking's result. And um, uh, people are uh, trying to generalize this to a larger class of black holes, uh, like the ones which one sees in the uh, M87 galaxy. Uh, but, um, uh, but this is ongoing work. But I just want to sort of, uh, 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 more or less, c uh, coming to the end, uh, 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 just uh, 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 convey why quantum gravity is not just something very esoteric. Uh, it just not just for black holes, but it also uh, it, it also is important to understand the birth of the universe uh, because our current understanding of the evolution of the universe and the right hand side shows you the detailed picture that we have of um, both the uh, radiation that we measure from the original Big Bang, that's the upper picture on the right, uh, and the lower picture on the right is a measure of the matter distribution in galaxies. Actually, those fiber filaments that you see are the clusters of galaxies, or superclusters, actually. And you see that the universe is not homogeneous. There are sort of these uh, fibers. They almost look like the neurons that you see in many of the, uh, like in the previous talks and so on. So it's like there is this, um, uh, uh, and the uh, the upper one also is uh, uh, the radiation is also not homogeneous. You see the blue spots are the slightly cooler ones, and the yellow ones and the red ones are slightly warmer. So even that has a very inhomogeneous character. And th that inhomogeneous character uh, is actually responsible. The, uh, the original inhomogeneities seeded all these galaxies, and that's why our current universe has this inhomogeneous uh, uh, form. And quantum fluctuations is what gives rise to these uh, uh, universal, um, uh, these inhomogeneities that are the result uh, of evolving the universe from the very early stages. Those quantum fluctuations get amplified, and you see them now in the universe as big voids or big structures. So it's rather remarkable that 
very tiny quantum fluctuations give rise to the big universe that we see with all its character today. So to understand the detailed nature of, these, of the structure that we see in the universe today, we need to understand the quantum fluctuations at the very origin of the Big Bang. And that's another challenge for string theory and any other framework of quantum gravity. And um, uh, so uh, this is to sort of convey the importance of, of uh, <laughs> convey the importance of uh, understanding uh, gravity at the quantum level. And indeed, Hawking went on later, uh, some of Hawking's contributions uh, in the 80s were in uh, understanding some of these quantum fluctuations uh, uh, in the very early universe, but it's a subject that still continues, uh, still needs uh, a uh, more complete understanding and, uh, as I said, is one of the uh, open problems for string theory today. So I just want to finally end with uh, uh, mentioning Hawking's visit to India uh, in 2001. That was, in a way, his only scientific visit uh, to India. It was in the context of the Strings 2001 uh, conference that was the first time this meeting was held uh, outside North America or Europe, and it was in a way a, a testimony to the strong string theory community that had grown in India and was contributing at the forefront uh, of the subject. And uh, uh, so you see a picture uh, the, uh, in shot in the TIFR Mumbai lawns of Stephen Hawking and together with David Gross and Edward Witten, who are some of the uh, leading physicists, um, and on the right you see a press conference and uh, at TIFR and you see all the, uh, the press people couldn't have enough of uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, and the person you see sitting next to Stephen Hawking is Spentavadio, who is sitting right there right now, uh, but uh, in a younger avatar. Uh, but uh, uh, but I, I, I thought I would mention this uh, to, um, to make people aware that uh, the efforts in understanding quantum gravity are, are being spearheaded in India by a community of theoretical physicists from various institutions around the country, and TIFR centers in Mumbai and Bangalore, in uh, HRI in Allahabad, in ISAR Pune, in, um, in um, various of the other ISARs, in the Indian Institute of Science, and so on. So it, it's a remarkable success story, I think, that Indian science can uh, contribute at the frontier level, which is in a way what uh, this meeting is all about to sort of enthuse the younger generation to go into uh, to science. And, uh, uh, and um, uh, this is to give you confidence that it can be done in India. Uh, so I'll end with just a sort of an inspirational quote from Hawking. And uh, uh, so thank you very much.